In section 1.2, we're going to kind of pause from what we were doing in section 1 and look at domain and range because we just ended that last lecture talking about our parent functions and some of their characteristics. So let's kind of take a moment and let's um, write out in words our definition of domain. And we've already alluded to this, like I said, in the previous lecture. So domain is the set of possible, keyword, possible input values or, if you like, x values. And we've already talked about how our x values are our input or our domain. And so the domain is all the possibilities. It does not say when it occurs or how often it occurs. It just says it occurs. And so range is the set of, again, possible output values. Again, these are your Y values. And so I just want to emphasize it is possible. And these are your X's and these are your Y's. And again, if you need to keep the domain and range straight, I always like to remember it. It's very systematic. It's alphabetical. D comes before R. X comes before Y, and sometimes that'll help you to remember how to do it. Now, when we're stating our domain range, there's three possible ways that you're going to see some of this notation. And you saw a little bit of this earlier when we we're talking about our parent functions. Say you had the inequality 5 is less than H is less than or equal to 10. This would be the inequality of all the H values between 5 and 10 and including 10. And as we talk about domain and range, you're going to see these different notations that you're going to have to enter on your online homework or on your exam. So I want to make sure I give, kind of give you a table outlining what they look like and also emphasizing these, that this is your inequalities. Written as a set builder notation, the set builder notation, we write a little bit differently. And so it's written like this. It has a curly bracket, H such that 5 is less than H is less than or equal to 10. And you've seen the set builder notation in a college algebra course um, before this course. And so when you're looking at it, it means that all the values in the set, that's why I use those curly brackets, and this little up and down mark is such that. A lot of times in math, we shorthand what we're doing. Math people are lazy. That's when we like formulas. We like variables to represent unknown. We want to pull as much data as we can out without having to read a whole paper about it. So we shorthand it and we say that such that, but you'll notice that in your set builder notation, you still have that inequality just right here. And what this is, this is your conditions. So this is your conditions, and right here is your variable. And so that's the same value. It's just written in a different form. And then your interval notation is your briefest notation. This means we want to include everything from 5 to 10, and then we do a bracket on the 10, and that's because we have this equal to over here. And so just be aware of each of these notations. And again, you've already seen the interval notation because we were just using that in that average rate of change um, that you're going to see in these sections. Then we have 5 is less than or equal to H is less than 10. Let me kind of change up those inequalities. Again, your inequality notation, that's because you have those greater thans or less thans. As set builder, it'll be a bracket H such that 5 is less than or equal to H is less than 10. So there's your inequality notation within your set builder. And then this is still 5 to 10, but since we have the equal to on the 5, we're going to have a bracket on the 5. Since we're just less than on the 10, we're going to have a parenthesis. Say we had H is just less than 10. This would be H such that H is less than 10. You can see how those are related. And then we want all the values smaller than 10. So this would be negative infinity to 10. Hopefully you're having flashback to your algebra days here with this notation. Whenever you do your infinity, this is always a parenthesis on infinity. I also have a parenthesis on 10 because I was just less than 10. I was not equal to it. 
but let's do that one. Say I had h greater than or equal to 10. This would be h such that h is greater than or equal to 10. And then this would be 10 is your smallest going to positive infinity. Always put parentheses on infinities, bracket on the 10 because we're including it. All real numbers you already see in some of our domains on the previous section, and we could say all real numbers. Um, another notation for that is that double stemmed R that we've already looked at. And we write that as X such that H, excuse me, H such that H is an element of the real numbers. And this little C with a line in it, this little symbol here, this means element of, learning new things today. And this would be all your numbers. So we want to go negative infinity to infinity. So again, you've seen this as you work through your college algebra, algebra courses, but I just want to kind of give you a good reference and resource here to remind you of different things, because as you work through problems, they're going to be specific on inequality notation, set builder notation, or interval notation on how they want the answers entered. Now, what I want to do is I want to shortly, if you'll flip back in your notes, I want to jump back to 1.1 and I want to look at some of these parent functions. Now, if you look at some of these, and we're talking about domain and range, let's kind of jump in the middle here. You can see when we were talking about domain and range, we were using these notations. We talked about how the domain was all real numbers. That was all the possible x values. We talked about how on this function here, that it was, we talked about how the width was growing and how the height was growing. And so again, that's how you can see all possible x values is the real numbers all possible y values was all real numbers. Well, let's look at one that was restricted. We talked about how with the reciprocal function, see we had highlighted, we talked about how you can't have division by zero. And so look, you've got just y can't equal zero, or over here with this one, we have that inequality of y being greater than zero. And so I wanna kinda of emphasize, when we're talking about the possibilities of your domain and range, knowing your parent functions and their possibilities helps you better to deal with any functions that may have stemmed off of it and state your domain and range. So let's just kinda of move forward. Here's our parent functions. I wanna kinda of reference that and kinda of tie these two together. But let's move down here and let's go forward in the notes and let's look at some situations where we're gonna to have to identify domain and range and move off of parent functions, which hopefully you're familiar with because we kinda of harp on that through algebra days. So this one says, describe the intervals of values shown on the line graph using set builder and interval notation. So I'm gonna to have to do set builder and I'm gonna to have to do interval notation, okay? So first of all, I'm gonna look at what's going on with this. Well, we can see that we have values between one and three and between five and look, there's a parentheses there. And so interval wise, I would want all the values between one and three and I would want the values starting at five but not including five to positive infinity and we never include that infinity because as Buzz Lightyear says, to infinity and beyond. So there's never a point that we're gonna reach it. And then I want both of those in my solution. So we put a U here. When you have a U right here, this is the union or marrying these two together. So you do have to have that notation as you enter that. So there is my interval notation. Match the colors there. Now let's do our set builder notation. Well, our set builder notation would be x such that x is between 1 and 3 or x is greater than 5. And you're going to see this notation as we work with um, unions. That or is going to be the same thing as using your union. So that right there would be your set builder notation. So you're going to have to be able to pull information, just kind of starting basic with just a number line. So there's your x values. But let's drop down and let's look at the next one and let's look at some graphs because you're going to have questions like this on your homework. Write the domain and range of the functions as an inequality and interval notation. So we're looking for inequalities and interval notation. So we have domain, 
we have domain, and we have range. Now remember, domain is your x's, range is your y's, so alphabetical order. So you can see that when I'm looking at x's, it would start at negative 5 and go to 3. So I'm going to say negative 5 to 3. It's open at 3, so I'm going to use parentheses. It's closed at 5, so I'm going to use a bracket. So there's my interval notation. Let's jump down and do range. On my range, the highest it goes is right here. So that's at 2. The lowest it goes is right here, and that's at 0. I know you can't see them. Let me maybe erase so we can see our graph better. Let me mark my, take up my markings there. You'll notice that here at 2, I have a value here, but I don't have a value here, and I'm looking side to side here. So since I at least have a value here, I'm going to include it, because remember, it's possibilities. And then here, you can see I did have a value there. There wasn't an open circle, so I'm going to include it as well. So there's the interval notation for domain and range. But it also wants me to do the inequality. So I'm just going to drop below it here. And I'll do it out to the side. Um, the interval we got, so let's now do the inequality. So this would be negative 5, x, and 3. We're going to include negative 5, and we're not going to include 3. I'm going to go from 0 to 2, and I'm on the Y, so I need to switch letters, and I want to include both of those values. If you're a little confused, let's look at the next one. So I'm going to do domain and range. Domains is my X's, and so left to right, you can see right here is where my X's start, and here is where they end. And so that would be include 3 excuse me, negative 3, and go to 2, but don't include it because see right there, it's open circle, so we're just going to go up and not touch it. And then when you look at your y's, here's the highest, here's the highest, and here's the lowest. So I'm going to state those intervals. So let's see, the lowest is at negative 5, the highest is at 4. I do have a point at 4, and I do have a point at 5, and so I'm going to use brackets on both of those. If I was writing these as an inequality, so just rewriting here, this would be negative 3 to 2 on your x's, include the 3, but not the 2. On the range, that would be going negative 5 to 4, and I want to include them both and make sure I change to a y, because I'm talking about possibilities on y. So you're going to be able have to be able to pull your data from your graph and state your domain and range, but hopefully this helps with that. Just reach out to me if you need some additional help. Now moving forward, we've looked at a graph, we looked at a number line, so let's look at domain on an equation. And so what I want to emphasize on the domain of an equation is look for problem spots. Kind of assume that everything works or everything is in the real number lines, but then think about what could be removed or omitted. And so just kind of some helpful hints for you. Um, you want to look for places where you're going to have a negative under that square root, because remember, previous math courses, um, that's where your complex numbers come into play, or a zero in the denominator, because we can't divide by zero. So let's look at some information and see what we can pull from it. So for part A, I want to look at this equation f of x is equal to 2 square roots of x plus 4. And I want to figure out what is its domain. Well, there's a couple ways you can consider this. Look for your problem areas. Well, also remember what's going on with your parent functions. Because if you remember this parent function and the graph from section 1, that was something that only existed in that first quadrant. And that's why we would have to look for a negative under the square root, because that negatives did not exist in our domain. So as we adjust to this new function, we will look for this part right here not to be negative. So I'm going to say that. I want x plus 4 not to be negative, so therefore it has to be greater than or equal to 0. I solve my simple inequality here. This gives me x greater than or equal to negative 4. 
So right there, that would be my domain. Anything bigger than negative four would cause me to be in the real numbers, not complex. So therefore my domain interval notation would be negative four to infinity. And again, it's because this part right here cannot be negative. So you're gonna to have to do a little bit of simple solving there. Let's look at another situation. Say g of x is equal to three over six minus three x. Well, here's our problem area. Can't have zero in the denominator. Now don't shortcut yourself and say, oh, zero, can't be zero. No, it can't be zero in the denominator. So now you have to say six minus three x cannot be zero because if I have a zero right here, can't equal zero. My calculator can't do it. And then I can't graph it because that value doesn't exist. So I'm just going to solve this simple inequality. So I'm going to subtract six over, not inequality, but simple problem here. See, it can't be equal to negative six, divide by negative three. You know how to solve. So X can't be equal to two. Okay, that's fine. But we need interval notation to better show what the values are. So I'm going to do everything but that. And I told you we start with everything being in the real numbers and then we take out the stuff that's a problem. So that would be negative infinity to two union with two to positive infinity. And that right there would be the interval notation such that X doesn't equal two. So just be aware of that. If you have issues with entering, send me a message, say, hey, I'm working on 1.2 homework. I couldn't get number seven. Can you check my work? Because I can see everything that you're entering on that online homework. So we've got domain, range. We've got how we can find that in equations. This next function, we need to kind of spend some time on. So this next function says piecewise function. Well, a piecewise function is exactly how it sounds. It is pieces of functions that have been put together. So this is, excuse me, a function defined by two or more equations over a specified domain. So let's put that in better words. A function defined by two or more equations, putting our pieces together, over a specified domain, over a special interval of x's. And so an example of that would say sketch a graph of the function. So this would be, excuse me, Cortano was trying to help me with this lecture today. Sorry about that. So this would be f of x is equal to, say, x squared, 3, and 6 minus x. Now, this is not something you would have to create at this point, but this would just be something that would be given. And they say if x is greater than 1, it's going to be 3. If 1 is less than x is less than or equal to 2, and if x is greater than two. So when you're setting up a piecewise function, this part over here, kind of like your set builder notation, is your conditions. And so you read it backwards than you would assume. You first look at your conditions and say, what is the x is gonna be there? Then from those conditions, you come over here and look at your functions. And so let's kind of graph them out, and then we'll kind of put it together. So first thing you can see when X is less than or equal to one, that it's a quadratic. And we know our quadratic from our parent functions from section one. And so that would look something like, so all the way up until X is one, it's gonna be a quadratic. So it would be something like this. Then when it gets to one, it's equal to there. So I put a solid dot. Then between one and two, so here's two. It's a constant function. This constant function of three is just a horizontal line. Again, that goes back to your parent functions in section one. And so it's a horizontal line at three. So at three, we're gonna have to jump up here to three and put a circle, because it's not equal to at one, over to two, and it's equal to there. It's a little bit harder to read. 
And again, that's that horizontal line. But we're just taking a piece of it out. We're doing piecewise function. Then at 2, it's going to pick up your linear function. Now your linear function is 6 minus x. And we know how to graph linear functions. You start at 6. And then you go down 1 over 1. And so you get something like this line here. And then once it gets to 2, it's going to pick up again. And so right here at 2, it starts. And then it comes down. And so I'm going to take my eraser. Now that you kind of see that, I'm going to take my small eraser here. And I'm going to erase all this little extra stuff so that you can see what this piecewise function looks like. I'm just kind of erasing the rest of the graphs that I was using to get all these pieces together. And so you can see it's, it's kind of crazy. It took all these different little pieces. So I have a curve in here. I have a little straight line. And then I have this linear function. But I specifically wanted to do this because I wanted to show you how to read a piecewise function because most students don't know how to read it. And then if you have to evaluate this, you're trying to plug it into all three. But again, you look at your conditions, and then you go into your function. Graphing takes a little bit more time. The majority of these, we're going to use more of an evaluating thing. So if you're evaluating at x, look at your condition first, and then plug into that equation from there. So I hope this helps with section 1.2. But if you have any questions along the way, shoot me a Canvas message. I'll be happy to help.